Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Hope. If we haven't met yet, my name is Jason. I'm the lead pastor on staff. And before I get going with today's message, I have two things I want to say quick. First of all, I want to give a huge shout out to the Economa Girls Volleyball team because, man, this weekend they went to state and they played their hearts out and, and they represented our community so well. And I know they're disappointed by being runners up, but they should be proud of the way they played. So I want to give a shout out to the girls volleyball team over at Economawak High School. Also, I want to mention what we just saw in the video. In two weeks, we're starting a brand new series called Welcome to Wonderland. We are going into Christmas season and we're doing it the Sunday before, Chris, before Thanksgiving. So it's a lot of drama around that. We'll keep the Christmas music at a minimum, but we're going to start talking Christmas. And what we're talking about in this series specifically is the fact that one of the greatest gifts God gave us as human beings is the ability to wonder. And when children are born, they're overflowing with wonder. Yet we live in a world that seems to squeeze the wonder right out of us. And as a result, that doesn't only impact our emotional health, that impacts our spiritual health. So in this series, as we get ready for Christmas, we want to look at how to regain a sense of wonder in our lives. So if you have a friend you've been wanting to invite the church to check things out, this will be a great series to invite a friend along. And in fact, if you bring a friend, I'll make you a promise. I won't talk about generosity for five weeks. That's the deal going in. And the reason why I say that is because uh, today we're in part four of our series, Second Stage. And if you've missed what we're talking about, Second Stage is a two-year generosity initiative. This is a two-year generosity initiative for the people who consider hope to be their church. And over the next two years, we have three mission-critical goals that we want to accomplish as a church. Now, if you're not part of this church, I want to reiterate what I said in part one of this series. If you're not part of this church, you have my blessing to say, I'm not giving a dollar to this church because this is not about what this church wants for you. But there are three mission critical goals that we're trying to accomplish. We want to elevate our ministry. We want to elevate our mission. And we want to elevate our impact as a church. By elevating our ministry over the next two years, we want to get more ministry accomplished than we've ever done before. By elevating our mission, we want to acquire a facility right here in the Economawak area because that will help us change more lives and eternities than ever before. We've always said it around here that way. Our mission is to change lives and change eternities, and a facility will allow us to do that. And by the way, as an aside, we're not waiting two years to start to figure that out. We are pursuing options right now now. So please be in prayer for our church that God will open the right door for us for a solution for a facility of our own so we can elevate our mission. And third, we want to elevate our impact. Every year we are so blessed that we get to give away tens of thousands of dollars to charities in our community that are making a difference with homelessness, with health care, with poverty, with education. And we want to resource them at a higher level than we've ever done before. We want to give them more money than we've ever given them before by turning up our generosity. And if you've missed any part of the series or you want to learn more about the details of what we're accomplishing, there's a couple ways to do that. First, you can go to this website we set up, secondstageelevates.com. If you go there, you'll find all the videos we've produced, all the information of what we're trying to accomplish, and all the messages that, we've, uh, that I've sp- spoken on every Sunday. If you've missed any of those, it's all online here. And all the information is also in your mission guide. In fact, if you uh, have a mission guide, you can open that up to page 55. You'll find a space there to take notes this morning, uh, but it'll tell you everything that's going on in the series. And the reason why our goal is 100% engagement is because of the principle we've been unpacking every week of this series. The big idea we've been looking at all series long is that generosity generates change. Yes, we have three mission critical goals, but that's not the primary thing we're after. Our goal is that 100% of us would go before God and ask, God, what should my level of generosity look like over the next two years? And the reason why that's important is because what we've been learning in this series is that generosity is one of the most powerful forces in the universe, and we have the ability to harness it. Generosity is something that can change who we are. It can change the way that we relate to God. It can change the way that we trust in God. Generosity can change the way we view and relate to other people. And not only that, but when we have a church full of people who decide we are turning up our generosity, that will create a powerful community that when people walk into this church, they will be impacted by our generosity and it will change them. 
And not only that, but God unleashes change in our world through generosity, like we saw in week one. In the life of Jesus, there was a boy who had a lunch to eat, and Jesus told his disciples, hey, you need to give all these thousands of people something to eat. And one boy obeyed Jesus. He said, all right, here's what Jesus asked me to do. He took what he had, he put it in Jesus' hands, and it was not enough to meet the need, but God showed up to do more than he could ask or imagine, and that little boy, through his generosity, unleashed a miracle, and lives were changed that day. Generosity generates change. And what's been so encouraging for me as Hope's pastor in this season is hearing all the stories from so many different people, from so many different economic backgrounds about how this principle is already impacting their lives. Uh, Many of you have already shared what second stage means to you. And as you've been preparing to turn up your generosity, you've been sharing about how life-changing and faith-changing this whole exercise has been for you. And the reason why that's encouraging for me is when your mission is to change lives and eternities, it's kind of hard to measure forward progress. I mean, we know when someone puts their faith in Jesus and their eternal destination has changed, they can testify to that. They can get baptized. But life change that comes after that is harder to measure because Jesus says once we become Christians, once we become followers of him, that's not the end of the road. It's the beginning. He wants you to grow in your love, in your faith, in your joy, in your resilience, in your strength, in your power, in your humility, in your contentment, in your satisfaction, in your godliness. He wants that abundant life to well up and grow inside of you. But that's hard to measure as a church. But when people come and share their stories about not only how hope has changed their lives, but how second stage is changing their lives, man, that's powerful and it's exciting and it's encouraging for me as Hope's pastor. Well, today, we're going to drill down another layer deeper. We've been talking about all series long how generosity generates change. Today, we're going to look at something specific and powerful that generosity has the power to do in our lives. Here's our big idea today. This way, if you fall asleep because it's boring, at least you'll know what the sermon was about. Generosity generates exponential growth. Generosity has the power to generate exponential growth in us and around us. Now, to talk about this idea today, we're going to look at the life of a man named Paul. Uh, Sometimes he's referred to as the Apostle Paul. He was a man who lived in the first century. And if you've ever been suspect of Christians, because when you show up in church, we seem to be talking about money, you are going to love Paul because he wasn't just suspect of Christians, he hated them. In fact, he wanted to see every single Christian he could thrown into prison. He oversaw the execution of Christians. And the reason why was because he was incredibly offended by the Christian message. The Christian message was Jesus died on a cross and he rose on the third day. He died on a cross to pay for the sins of the world and then he walked out of his tomb on the third day and Paul didn't believe any of that was true and he thought it was offensive and he thought it was dangerous and he did everything he could to wipe out this Christian movement right up to the day when he became one. And the reason why Paul became a Christian is because he suddenly became convinced that what they were saying was accurate. Jesus did indeed walk out of the tomb on Easter Sunday, which means he is the Son of God. So Paul spent the rest of his life going to all the major cities of the Roman Empire, planting churches, telling people about Jesus and who he is, but he never stayed anywhere for a long time. He would go to a city, he would tell people about Jesus, he would raise up some leaders, he would start a church, and then he would go on to the next city. And he would leave those leaders in charge. But he would uh, hear back from them. He would write letters to them. Hey, how's it going, guys? Here's some things to remember. Don't forget this. To help them as they follow Jesus in their new life as Christians. In fact, many of the letters that he wrote were so significant, people collected them together and bound them together. And they make up part of what we have today in the Bible as the New Testament. So today we're going to look at one of these letters. He wrote to a group of Christians in the ancient city of Corinth. And part of following Jesus, he wants them to know, is the practice of financial generosity. And in this section, in fact, if you want to get context for what we say today and you want to do some study at home, um, read 2 Corinthians chapters 8 and 9. 2 Corinthians 8 and 9. Today we're just going to look at a few verses from chapters 9. But in this section, he connects the dots between the importance of financial generosity 
in terms of your faith and your trust in the way that you relate to God. And he doesn't just say that generosity generates change. Today, he shows us how generosity generates exponential growth. So we're going to be in 2 Corinthians 9, starting at verse 6, where Paul writes, remember this, which means this is something that everything and everyone around you doesn't want you to pay attention to. So Paul says, hey, everyone, wake up, look at me, eyes up here, remember this, because this is something that no one else is going to help you remember. Pay attention. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Now, this is a principle that we find throughout the pages of the Bible, and in fact, in many other philosophies as well, I call it the law of the harvest. The law of the harvest has three components to it. The first one is you reap what you sow. Now, other religions and philosophies have picked up on this idea. Some people call it karma. Some people just say what goes around comes around. But the law of the harvest is simple. You reap what you sow. Which means if you sow a kernel of corn, if you plant a kernel of corn in the ground, you're not going to get bananas. Now, if you take that kernel of corn and you plant it and you get on your knees and you pray fervently, dear God, would you give me bananas? Do you know what will happen? You'll get corn, okay? In case you don't farm, that's what their garden, that's what will happen. You will still get corn. That's the law of the harvest. You reap what you sow. Second component of it is this. What you sow now, you will reap later. If you sow corn at breakfast, you don't get corn for dinner that night. You plant in the spring. You plant in planting season. And over a period of time it grows. And then at the end of that season, a harvest season begins. So whatever you sow now, you will reap later. And the third component is whatever you sow you will reap greater. There will be a harvest. It will be exponential. So if you plant one kernel of corn, you do not get one kernel of corn in return. You do not get two kernels of corn. You get a whole meal of corn. You get dinner if you want corn for dinner. That's the law of the harvest. Well, you sow now, you reap later, and you reap greater. Now, the fundamental principle behind this is simple. All of life is connected. And there is a direct connection between your behaviors and your outcomes. In other words, while we like to see life as a series of isolated paths, or isolated decisions and events, the biblical authors understood that life is a path, and every day you're taking steps further down that path to a very specific destination. The path you choose to walk down has a destination. Where you have arrived today is a result of the way you behaved yesterday. And how you are behaving today will dictate where you end up tomorrow. This is the law of the harvest. The law of the harvest is not an indication that God is blessing you or punishing you more than anyone else. It's a principle that he made and it is unbreakable. You can either harness it to your benefit, you can ignore it to your peril, but it is not an indication of how fervently you pray. It is not an indication of whether or not God loves you. What you sow you reap later, and you reap greater. Now, this is such a powerful principle that parents have been yelling at their teenagers for centuries to get off their cell phone and choose better friends because they understand how the law of the harvest works. We've all bumped up against it. And it's no surprise that the biblical authors use this principle to explain and unpack many different situations in life. But in this section, in 2 Corinthians 9, The Apostle Paul is very specifically applying this principle to your financial generosity. And by saying that it follows the law of the harvest, what he's telling us is, you guys, listen up. There is a small window where you can plant. There is a small window where you can sow, and that season will come to an end. If a farmer misses springtime planting, he can't just go out to the field in summer and say, whoops, I missed my opportunity. I'm going to go plant now. It is too late, baby, baby. It's too late. You missed your window. And if you only sowed sparingly in your window, you will have a narrow sparing harvest. But if you're a farmer and you sow generously, you're going to have a generous harvest. 
So Paul wants us to imagine there's a farmer in ancient times and he's going out to the field and he thinks to himself, well, I don't want to sow very much seed because if I sow a lot of seed, then I won't have much seed left for myself. Paul's like, are you kidding? If you're a farmer and you don't want to sow seed because you want to keep more seed for yourself, you will soon be a very hungry farmer, okay? You're going to be an unemployed farmer. A farmer would go out and get every acre he could and maximize every square inch of soil on that acre that he could in the window that he could plant the seed so that he could have a big harvest. What Paul is saying is right now you have a window. And what you do with your financial generosity obeys the law of the harvest. With your financial generosity, what you sow now, you will reap later and you will reap greater. But here's the the important idea that we want to pull out of this. Sow in anticipation of a harvest. Practice financial generosity in anticipation of a harvest. Now, what does he mean by a harvest? He's going to explain it, but before he explains it, he wants to talk a little bit more about how we approach financial generosity. Okay, here's what he says in the next verse. Each of you, in other words, this has nothing to do with anybody else, and we said a few weeks ago, generosity has nothing to do with quantity, it has to do with cost, it's a very individual thing, so don't compare yourself, this is an each of you thing, you and God. Each of you should give Well, you have decided, in other words, this isn't just, hey, what's in my wallet? It's, no, we have a plan. I've decided this. Well, you have decided in your heart to give, and to the ancients, your heart was not the seat of your emotions. The heart was the center of who you are as a person, and you have values, and you have priorities. So what Paul is writing is, you need to figure out what actually matters in your life and organize it. And that's how you should practice generosity according to what actually matters in your life. Well, you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. In fact, if you asked Paul, how would you define a generous person? Paul would say, that's easy, a cheerful giver. That's generosity in Paul's mind, someone who is glad to do it, and they're not just generous in their heart, they're actually generous with what they do. That's how Paul defined a generous person. Now, In this verse, Paul says something that is so offensive, I would never have the courage to say what he said. In fact, if I stood up here some Sunday and I said what Paul said in this verse, I would get emails all week long about, Jason, you really hurt some people's feelings. What if there are some people who are new to the church and they would have taken that in the wrong way? So just for the record, I would never say this. But I am going to tell you what Paul said right here. Look at this last line that Paul wrote. Did you catch it? Read this last line. God loves a cheerful giver. God loves a cheerful giver. God loves a cheerful giver. To which people say, wait a minute, I thought God loves everybody. In fact, some of you went to Sunday school when you were little kids and you learned the song, red and yellow, black and white, all are precious in his sight. Paul says, yeah, I know. Guys, I I wrote half the New Testament. I know that. I get that, okay? Chill out. But I'm telling you, Paul said, God loves a cheerful giver. Well, let me frame this in a way that perhaps more of us can relate to. Uh, And if you have ever raised children, you will totally relate to this. If you haven't raised children, I think you'll probably be able to to still follow along with this. When when my boys were little, uh, Kathy and I have three boys. Our oldest is in high school now, and he's trying to get bigger than me, which I don't appreciate. But when they were little, I could still manage them. We had a Nintendo Wii, the gaming console, and when Christmas would roll around, I would buy them whatever game was cool and fun and reminded me of being in college. So I would uh, get them, that's what I did all college long, Um, so I'd get them whatever game and we'd wrap it up and put it under the tree and they would open it up at Christmas time and they'd be so excited, oh dad, thank you, this is awesome, and give me big hugs, can we go play? And I'm like, absolutely, it's Christmas, go play your new game. So they would go load it up into the Wii and they'd start playing and they would have so much fun and I would watch them. And maybe after a day or so, I would think to myself, that looks fun. I think I want to play that. So I'd go up to my kids, and I would say, hey, can I have a turn next? And do you know what my kids would say? Dear Father, we are appreciative that you bought us this game. 
And we recognize that you bought us this game because of your great and deep love for us, your children. In fact, we recognize that without you, we wouldn't have this game to say nothing of the console or the television or the roof over our heads. So, so Dad, here's the control. Why don't you play for an hour or two? We're going to go clean our bedrooms because they're full of all the other toys you bought us. And your kids didn't say that either, did they? Or it's like when you go to the restaurant with your kids and as you look at the menu, you are thinking to yourself, I remember how affordable eating out used to be before these little human need machines showed up. And they order their food and you order your food and when the food comes out, you're already kicking yourself for taking the healthy option because you got a salad and those french fries look amazing. So you ask your child, sweetheart, can I have a french fry please? And what do they say? No. Come on. I bought you the meal. I brought you here. I paid for dinner. I want one French fry. Now, here's the question. When your kids do that, do you still love your children? Yes or no? Yes, you still love your children. But something in your heart is grieved. Something in your heart is a little bit concerned at the self-centeredness that you see there, that they can't take something they just freely received as a gift because you love them and you provide for them, and they can't just share a tiny piece of that back with you. God loves a cheerful giver. Not because he doesn't love you otherwise. He, when you think of cheerful giver, you should think of God. He's the ultimate cheerful giver. He's a God who gave his son, Jesus. Jesus is the ultimate cheerful giver. He saw our debt of sin. We could never repay to God. And he stepped in. He said, I will take on your debt. I will transfer your accountability onto myself. And that's what he was doing on the cross. He was paying for our debt of sin before God. He suffered the wrath of God in your place. That's what kind of cheerful giver God is. He paid for your sin. He gave you as a gift the righteousness that we don't have. And he died for our sin. He rose on the third day. And on top of that, he gives us so much in this life. He gives us so much more than we need. And God comes along and he says, hey, I've given you so much because I love you, because I'm a good father in heaven. Can you take some of that and use it to make a difference for the things in your generation that break my heart? There are people who don't know me in your community. I want them to know me. I want them to put their hope in Jesus, my son. I want you to make a difference and make the world a better place? Would you take some of what I have given you and you unleash it for that kind of good? Does God love you no matter what? Yeah, he's a good God, but God loves a cheerful giver because he's a cheerful giver and he wants children who reflect his love and reflect his heart. Now, with that approach down, now Paul begins to explain what he means when he talks about a harvest and why he tied financial generosity to the law of the harvest. And God, and God, the creator, God from eternity past to eternity future, God who sits enthroned in heaven and the angels right now as we sit here, angels are bowing down before him, mesmerized by his holiness and his glory. God is able to bless you abundantly. How is God able to bless you? abundantly, so that in all things, now answer this question, in which things? Okay, seeing if anyone is awake. In all things, at all times, at which times? Having all that you need, how much of what you need will you have? You will abound in every good work as it is written. And he quotes Psalm 112. They have freely scattered their gifts to the poor. Their righteousness endures forever. It says those who freely scatter, those who freely sow, those who are abundant and generous in their financial generosity will have righteousness that endures forever. Paul writes what we do 
because we love God and we want to serve people. Somehow that matters forever. And he says, this isn't even my idea. He's quoting the Old Testament. God has always operated according to this principle. The acts of righteousness you do because you are God's redeemed child matters. And it matters forever, he continues. Now, he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. Now, in the metaphor, what does seed refer to? The resources we are using to practice generosity. And the promise given here is that when you practice generosity, God will see to it that you have all the seed you need to continue to practice generosity. I've had people tell me as a pastor, you know, Jason, when I get to the next stage, one of my goals in life is to become generous. And I have honestly looked people right back in the eye and said, is that really your goal in life? Because generosity begins now with whatever God has given to you. And when you practice generosity with whatever God has given you, he gave a promise. He will increase your store of seed. He's going to increase because God loves to see generous people, just like you love it when your kids practice generosity with what you give to them. He'll make sure you have all you need to continue to be generous, and he will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. So he says it again. When you practice generosity, when you abound in good works, somehow it matters forever. There is a harvest of righteousness in your future. What you sow now, you reap later and you reap greater. And he's not just limiting it to the confines of birth to death. He's talking about eternity. But right now we have a narrow season where we have the opportunity to plant. Where we have the opportunity to scatter the seed. He continues. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity, those acts of generosity, will result in thanksgiving to God. This service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of the Lord's people, but is also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. Here's what he's saying here. God will use your generosity to create worship. When you practice generosity, God will leverage that and more people will pray, more people will give thanks, more people will worship and it will change lives and eternities. Here's how he wraps up the section. Because of this service by which you have proved yourselves, is how, how do you know you're a Christian? How do you know your faith is authentic? One of the ways is you live for eternity, not just for what I can grab for myself right now. You've proved yourselves. Others will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ and for your generosity in sharing with them and with everyone else. And in their prayers for you, people will be so impacted by what your generosity brings, they're going to pray for you. And in their prayers for you, their hearts will go out to you because of the surpassing grace God has given you. When they see that you have been generous, they'll be amazed at how gracious God has been to you. So let's sum up all this that Paul has taught in this section. When you sow generosity in God's kingdom, here's the four things that we've seen so far. Your supply of seed is multiplied. Your supply of seed is multiplied. What you have to do good, God says, I want you to keep doing good. Your supply of seed is multiplied. Second, your righteousness is multiplied. Somehow that matters and it lasts forever and there will be a harvest of it when you practice generosity. The worship of God is multiplied. More people will overflow with thanksgiving and be so thankful to God and thankful for you. In fact, this is a principle that we have seen in this church. This church was started because 18 people said we need a new church in our community. A denomination didn't start that. 18 people from Lake Country started this church. And out of their generosity, so many people have worshipped God and thanked God. So many lives and eternities have been changed. So when you sow generosity, your supply of seed is multiplied, your righteousness is multiplied, the worship is God, of God is multiplied, and Paul writes, your faith is verified. You, you have proved yourselves, he said, by your generosity. So we begin to see that generosity doesn't merely generate change. Generosity generates exponential growth. It is one of the most powerful forces in the universe. Now, as your pastor, 
I have never asked this church to do something unless I was willing to go first. For example, when I say I want everyone who calls this church their home to be engaged in ministry, to volunteer, to do something, I have to go first with that. So Monday through Saturday, I work a full work week. I work five, sometimes six days a week. I work a full-time schedule Monday through Saturday and get all my work done. Do you know why? Because I take Sundays off. So I can go to my church that I love and volunteer. I don't get paid for today. I get paid for what I do Monday through Saturday. Today, I just show up like all the amazing volunteers we have at this church because I just love to do this. I love to be able to serve in this way. In the same way, when I ask you to go before God for the second stage initiative and ask him what your level of generosity should be for the next two years. When I say go before God and ask him what kind of generosity would generate change? I'm not going to ask you to do that until Kathy and I do it first. Because see, this is something, again, I mentioned this last week, I don't get anything out of this. I, I get nothing. I don't get commission, okay? It's not how this works. All I get is more work. That's what I get out of this. But we're going to go first because we genuinely believe generosity generates exponential growth. And, and we want that in our lives. We want that in our community. So we've gone before God and, and we've already decided we are giving more to generosity in the next two years than we have ever given away before. By far, in terms of dollars, in terms of percentage, we're giving away more than we've ever given before. In fact, we wanted to make generosity our number one budget category, more than mortgage, more than house, more than anything else. We just wanted to make it our top priority for the next two years. And how's that going to work? I don't know yet, okay? It's, we're figuring that out. It means we're going to change our lifestyle. That's what it means. It means uh, we've got some stored assets, so we don't have a boat or cabin or anything like that, but we've got some savings for the future. So God will make sure we're fine. We, we want to trust him with our future way more than we trust some savings for our future. Because we believe in this, and we want to see God show up, and we want to leverage the power of generosity to change us and change our church and change the community and trust that God's going to do what he says he's going to do. And the reason why I've been so excited is because we're not doing this alone. In fact, last Sunday night, we had advanced commitment night. We let people come in and make their commitments ahead of time. And, and we had so many people say, I'm ready. Or, Jason, we're ready. And so many people are jumping all in with this already. And next Sunday, you're going to hear a lot of their stories. It's going to be so good. You don't want to miss next Sunday. In fact, you don't want to miss next Sunday because uh, it's Commitment Sunday where we'll have the opportunity to make our second stage commitments that represent our generosity over the next two years. But I'm excited that this is already changing our church. In fact, we want to show you a story uh, right now from a family who's already being impacted by this. Let's take a look. I am Tish Legro, and uh, we live in Watertown. I'm Steve Legro. We have three kids, uh, Stella, Madeline, and Benjamin. You know, Steve and I, financially, we, we, we never, like, money had, of course, with our couples, it's a hot topic, or it's, you know, you, you can either leave the table just completely fuming, or <laughs> um, you can actually make a plan and, and, it be a peaceful conversation. I came to Christ as a teenager, uh, and then I was single, of course, uh, as a young adult. Um, so I always tithed. Uh, I've always been tithed 10% of your earnings, and uh, I was a full-time student and working full-time. Um, it was amazing. Uh, I did still tithe, and I didn't know there were times where I was just like, oh, that's gonna hurt, but I'm gonna do it anyway. <laughs> yeah, you you wanna see God move in your life? Uh, trust him with your finances. <laughs> um, it, it becomes exciting. Yeah, we. Uh, I, I had never tithed before. Um, you know, I grew up in a church where you always put a quarter in the collection plate as, as, as it came by. I would say, about, I don't know, six months ago, um, I was just like, Steve, I really think the next step is, would be to tithe. And I was 
kind of scared to approach this because um, he just doesn't, didn't do it previously. And it was just there every time I would pray. So I, I talked to him about it and he was like, I agree. And I was completely shocked um, and incredibly grateful. But it's so funny, you know, the whole tithing conversation has come up and you know, all of a sudden we need a new roof on our, our, our house and it's a very steep roof. So you can imagine the cost, but it's funny, it's funny how, how that works. But it's like I, um, Pastor Jason said, if we are obedient, um, he shows up and he does things that, um, that he, he will do things that will, greater things than you can imagine. And I know, I know he will. So I just have to have faith. I just have to remember his promise. And I do. And we pray the roof doesn't leak. <laughs> yes. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so I, th I think in our marriage, it's, hope has transformed us. And I, th I think we're still working and walking through that. Um, we're, we're still walking the course right now financially. Um, but it's just opened our eyes to, to how we spend money and are we honoring God that way? And, um, it's still very a uh, hard conversation to have, but we, we're having it now. And it's made me invite Christ into our, our finances. And that's where I think um, we were, we were um, lacking, you know, because that's just another form of worshiping God and being obedient to the Lord. The second stage excites me because uh, I, I think it's truly going to be the beginning of what this church is going to eventually become. I think probably the biggest pushback I get when I invite people to church is, you know, it's, it's a mobile church. Is that the one that takes place in the middle school? And I'm like, yeah. And I, I think once, you know, once the church is uh, firmly kind of put on a rock, if you will, that it's, it's going to have an anchor point. It gives the feel that, okay, you know, we're, we're not peaking here. We're just, we're just start, starting on our journey. I'm excited about a uh, second stage because all the new people that are gonna that are gonna come that are gonna hear <clears throat> sorry that are gonna hear about his love oh, you know because um, you know a friend of mine invited me to church and it just changed it changed me um, it saved me it changed me and I look forward because that's gonna happen to someone and I'm overjoyed about that. I'm Steven. I'm Tish. And, and we're, we're all systems, systems go, go for second, second stage. stage. So next Sunday, we're going to have a chance to make a life-changing commitment. And, and again, if hope isn't your church, um, maybe you're just checking things out today and you don't know for your church yet, we don't have a relationship yet, hey, we respect that. Totally respect that. By the way, if you ever decide that this isn't the right church for you as you're checking it out, um, that's fine. Let me know. Let me help you find the right church. Th that's way more important than hurting my feelings or whatever. We just want you plugged in somewhere where your faith in God is growing to grow. So if this isn't your church, you have my blessing to opt out, but you don't have my blessing to fail to become a generous person. It generates change. It generates exponential growth. And I'm excited for all of you to have the opportunity to make that kind of commitment next Sunday. So there's three things I want to leave you with uh, before we uh, dismiss today. Uh, number one is this. This week, in the next seven days, pray that God will give us the boldness to trust that he will unleash a harvest of righteousness in us and through us. When a farmer goes out to plant that seed, there's a little bit of faith involved. There's a little bit of trust involved. And when we practice financial generosity, it's the same way. So ask that we will be bold to trust God that he will produce the harvest of righteousness that we can't see yet, but we'll be bold to trust him. Second, ask God what level of generosity would it take for him to generate this kind of exponential impact. 
in your life, in your season right now, you're not comparing yourself to anyone, and this has nothing to do with what I'm asking of you. This is all about what God asks you to do. What level of generosity would it take to generate this kind of exponential impact? And last thing today is this. Don't miss next week. Let me pray for you. Father, thank you for being a generous God, a good Father in heaven. All good gifts come from you, and the best gift, your Son, and eternal life through him came from you. Jesus, thank you for being a cheerful giver. You gave your life for us. You lived for us. You lived the life we couldn't live. You died for us. You died the death we deserved under God's wrath. You rose to give us new life. Thank you for being a cheerful giver. Thank you that at the end of this life we have eternity waiting for us and it will be amazing. You've given us this life to make a difference. You've given us this life and this is our season. This is our one shot to sow generously. So give us the courage to trust you. Give us hearts that are aligned with yours to unleash this kind of change in our world and in our own hearts. As we prepare next week to make our second stage commitment, Lord, give us a peace that passes understanding and confidence and hope in you. I pray it for this church in Jesus' name. Amen.